name is Stephen Markowitz, and I'm moderating this session. The session is called uh, Medical Advancements, Diagnosing and Treating uh, Mesothelioma and Asbestos-Related Diseases. Actually, it's a little broader than that. We're also going to be talking to some extent about prevention, both uh, primary prevention, by uh, that is to say reducing or eliminating exposure, and also secondary prevention, early detection of disease. We have excellent speakers. Uh, as we have had actually throughout the conference. Um, our first speaker, or actually the set of speakers, is Laura and Bob Kuzmik. They are social service uh, professionals uh, in uh, southeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, they work with uh, delinquent youth and families, uh, and they live in Ambler, Pennsylvania. We saw Ambler briefly in uh, the first movie yesterday. Um, and they're going to talk about their work to promote uh, the reduction, uh, elimination of exposure to asbestos uh, in Ambler. So welcome, Laura and Bob. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, Dr. Markowitz. Uh, thank you, Linda. Thank you to the ADAO community. It's really an honor to be here um, and really an honor to be on a panel with such esteemed medical professionals. So. Um, Really, thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, our story, which we've shared before, um, it began in 2002. We purchased a home um, that was built in 1960. It was part of that suburban housing boom that started in the 50s and developments and tracts of homes. And um, it was an older home. It had not been maintained. We got it at a bargain rate. It's in a good school district, a good neighborhood. And Bob had lots of uh, vision and you know, he got himself through college working construction. So he said, we can do this ourselves. And so we did. Um, we were young, we were enthusiastic, um, but we didn't know what was in our house. And um, you know, I was just a second pair of hands, hold this ladder still, hand me some nails. But then we got into, let's rip out this sheetrock Let's uh, sand this black stuff off the floor that was holding the carpet down. Um, let's, uh, let's just start going to town. And one of the biggest things that we did, we had a large family room, about 380 square feet with those brown, ugly tiles that we all know about. And my job as the unskilled laborer was to take a chisel and a hammer and break up that tile floor so that we could get to the subfloor underneath, which was cement. Um, some of those tiles popped right off with one whack of the hammer on the chisel, and some of them were a little more stubborn and took a lot more uh, breaking up. And sometimes there would be a little piece of tile so stuck onto the cement, the only way I could get it off was to smash it with a hammer into powder and disintegrate it. Um, I was very careful to wear protective eyewear and I wore earplugs because the hammering was so loud and I never gave a thought to what I was breathing in and what was going all over our house. And, you know, we were weekend warriors. We both worked full time outside the home. So um, our house was under construction. We had sawhorses up and it was years. And our daughter was 11 years old and her friends were in our house and our family members and guests were in our house. Um, and we didn't know that anything was wrong with what we had done until a few years later chatting with our neighbor who has the same floor plan as us. And he said, well, you know that that was asbestos on that floor you ripped up. And we said, no, like we didn't know that. We didn't know that. Um, and then we began to think like, where else was there asbestos in our home? And we had to kind of go back and retrace our steps and figure out like, what do we still have left? What can we get tested? We did get some samples tested. We had the cement shingle siding tested. We had the additional tiles that we hadn't disturbed. We were able to safely remove. It all had asbestos in it. So then came, you know, the guilt and the worry and the fear, um, the shame of, of not knowing what we did. And, um, you know, Bob reached out to the medical community. He's gonna talk about that. Um, he also reached out to Linda. He pretty much cold called Linda and said, hey, can I come to your conference? Because I need some answers. Um, once we started to get answers and information, we knew that we couldn't go back and undo what we did, but we knew that we could go forward 
And our journey became one of advocacy. And I'm so pleased to have heard so many speakers during this conference talk about advocacy because it's so important. Um, you know, we live in Ambler, but that's not why we were affected by asbestos. We were affected by asbestos because we are homeowners. We could have been anywhere. We could be anyone. We are, we are everyone. We are everyone who lives in a home. So we want the message out there. And that's our function and that's our role here. And we're so pleased to be a part of this community and this family. So Bob, take it away. So yeah, needless to say, you know, we had a lot of concerns and questions. And like Laura said, I cold called Linda and she answered <laughs> like in the second ring, which I wasn't expecting. And she uh, invited me to the conference. And I, I believe that year was 2015. Um, when I got there, I met uh, Marilyn Amento, who was featured in the Dirty Laundry video and found out she was from Ambler and that's met some more people from Ambler. Um, and that kind of led me, uh, led us on this journey to advocacy and uh, prevention and um, community outreach with ADAO. I met Linda uh, personally through, you know, uh, Marilyn, we got to speaking. Um, so since then, yes, I, we, Laura and I have done a lot of advocacy outreach and prevention on behalf of ADO. And we're very proud to do that. Um, you know, some of the things we do is, you know, assist with ADD, ADAO when we, they're contacting U.S. senators through phone or correspondence. Um, most of the stuff we do is grassroots in Ambler, which uh, I really enjoy. And we really enjoy. I know um, Linda had uh, put on a conference there in Ambler, not a conference, a, uh, a little, a, uh, an information uh, thing that was called Be Smart, Be Safe. Um, it was hosted by Linda and Brent Kynock was there. You know, and for stuff like that, we go door to door to shops, putting up flyers, invitations, letting them know the time, place, and if anyone's interested to please show up and there'll be more information available. Every year in October uh, coming up, sans this year due to COVID, there's an October Fest in Ambler. And I know two years ago we had a, uh, a tent and Tony Rich was there with his mother in Ambler. In Ambler, Marilyn was there. And again, provide flyers, information, pamphlets um, to the local community. Um, and I, one of the uh, most, <laughs> the pamphlets that was most taken off our, our stand, I remember Linda was the one where of the home where as asbestos could be found inside and outside of the home. So I was glad to see a lot of people were taking that pamphlet away because that was very important. And also just speaking with people, you make connections, you know, and I lead them, we lead them to ADO, ADAO's website for more professional and detailed information regarding um, asbestos, especially in the home. Um, so one of the final things I do is um, I, have blood drawn every year at Fox Chase Cancer Research Center outside, or it's inside Philadelphia, outside Ambler. Um, and it's, it's you know, obviously I'm not a medical professional, but they call it a mesomark assay. And they're just drawing my blood every June. Um, and they're trying Recording to- stopped. For mesothelioma is from what I understand it. Um, so that's one of the final things I do. So. You know, we do a lot of advocacy and outreach um, and speak about prevention um, in, in many ways. You know, I'll be walking down <laughs> the road with uh, my dog and meet a neighbor who just moved in and we'll be talking. And, uh, you know, they start talking about wanting to renovate their home. And there's another opportunity where I uh, just let them know what I know and what I've done. And the day, now nah, I don't want I don't want to scare them, but the warning signs. And again, I lead them to the website from ADAO for more professional, detailed information. So I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm happy to help in any way I can. Uh, Laura, both both of us, um, and you know, it's all about advocacy, outreach, and prevention. And um, we'll do what we can to uh, make it happen. So thanks. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, uh, great. Thank you, Laura and Bob. And I really think you are uh, not not so much mesothelioma warriors, but asbestos cancer prevention warriors, because this this 
this is just a crucial activity going forward for increased knowledge. Our next speaker um, is uh, Dr. Jackie Moline. And uh, Dr. Moline, this little preview for later today, Dr. Moline will receive the Irving J. Selikoff Lifetime Achievement Award at the end of the afternoon. Dr. Moline is Professor and Vice President of Occupational Medicine, Epidemiology and Prevention at Hofstra Northwell School of Medicine. She uh, trained and actually was a faculty member at Mount Sinai for 19 years, uh, where she, among other things, directed the World Trade Center Health Program, moved to Northwell, I don't know, a dozen years or so ago, uh, where she still, in addition to being vice president of the department uh, and school, is also uh, head, still head of the <coughs> World Trade Center Health Program. So, Jackie, welcome. Good morning, everyone, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about um, what to look out for in terms of asbestos-related diseases. And, and I thought that um, that was just such a great intro to this speech because people often don't know what symptoms might be associated with asbestos-related diseases. And I'm really gonna highlight um, this is a talk really about prevention and awareness, which is really the mission of ATAO. So currently the commercial use for asbestos in the United States um, is somewhat limited, but it's still there. Um, but where it was used in the past was as, as Dr. Flora has mentioned, uh, in brake pads, clutches, corrugated sheeting, cement pipes, roofing materials, and vinyl tile. Please understand that there, there were 3,000 different products that contained asbestos in the heyday of asbestos use in the United States. So this is just a, um, a brief listing of some of the products where asbestos was, um, was used and may still be found. Thankfully, it's no longer in brake pads and clutches, although it may be in vintage cars, and certainly folks who worked on them 30, 40 years ago will have had exposure. Okay, and um, one of the other elements, actually Dr. Flores touched on this, is, is something that people don't think about as much. And we did hear this um, from Ms. Borghi earlier uh, this morning, whose mom used cosmetic talc that led to her mesothelioma. Um, <clears throat> cosmetic talc obviously it contains talcum powder, uh, as well as loose face powders and other body powders. Industrial talc is something that people aren't aware of its use. It was used in the rubber manufacturing. It's an additive to paints, plastics, ceramics. Um, often it was used if people were um, made uh, uh, pottery. Uh, it was added as a strengthener to the clay. So what are some of the asbestos-related diseases? There are asbestos-related pleural diseases and asbestosis are non-malignant. And then there are four cancers that are associated with, meso with asbestos, and that includes mesothelioma, lung cancer, ovarian cancer, and laryngeal cancer. Asbestos-related cancers um, come from the inhalation of the fibers. And these are the four cancers, as I mentioned. You know, everyone thinks when we're thinking about asbestos and asbestos cancers of lung cancer and mesothelioma and predominantly mesothelioma because mesothelioma is what's called the signal or sentinel cancer for asbestos exposure. Meaning that if someone has mesothelioma, it should prompt a discussion of where were you exposed to asbestos. And we'll talk about that a little later with respect to the type of history that should be elicited and unfortunately is rarely elicited. So of those four cancers, and I think Dr. Markowitz will go into this in greater detail a little later this morning, the only one for which the United States Preventive Services Task Force, which is the government agency that lets us know whether screening tests will be covered by the federal government and in other insurers, is um, lung cancer screening has been um, added as being effective. And the age range just is now, has come down to 50 years. It's 50 to 80 years. So that um, as they've learned more, the age range has been expanded. 
but it's only for former smokers and uh, with a certain uh, pack year smoking history, which you can see how you can calculate that. Unfortunately, despite the American Thoracic Society and other professional organizations wanting to add occupation as another risk factor for people who should be eligible for this lung cancer screening, they have not added that. That doesn't mean you shouldn't make sure that your physician is aware of the fact that you had asbestos exposure because you are at increased risk for lung cancer if you've had asbestos exposure. Lung cancer screening, we know it can be effective if, it's, if you're diagnosed at stage one. This graphic actually is from a few years ago and thankfully things have changed a bit. Instead of it being six in 10, if it's stage one, and if it's non-small cell, there are different cell types of cancers. If it's non-stage one, if it's stage one, then the range of five-year survival is 70 to 90%. If you're diagnosed, however, at a later stage, less than one in 10 survive five years or more. So early detection and treatment, um, the type of work that Dr. Wolf and Dr. Flores do does save lives. But screening has not been found to be effective for mesothelioma, ovarian cancer, laryngeal cancer. Therefore, it's important to recognize the early warning signs. So what are some of these early warning signs? You know, some of them aren't specific. And by not specific meaning, it's not like I have this one symptom that's associated with mesothelioma or laryngeal cancer. One of the most common symptoms, and one of my mentors always said, the thing that you need to worry about is when someone says, I have this unusual fatigue and it just can't be explained away. And it is a very, I mean, right now, all of us are fatigued from COVID. I know that, and all of us have fatigue, but when there's a, like an existential fatigue, that is something that you should always bring up to your doctor um, and have them do an investigation. But some of the other more classic signs are uh, pain in the chest or lower back, shortness of breath. People think that they pulled a muscle um, and, and they don't understand it because it'll be a specific pain, a pain when they take a deep breath. Shortness of breath, a dry cough, trouble with swallowing, feeling like food gets stuck, hoarseness, and unexplained weight loss. Now, peritoneal mesothelioma, which is a mesothelioma that occurs in the abdomen, can occur more, more slowly in terms of symptoms because there's more room for fluid to spread before people are aware of it. But when people start having some abdominal pain, they have swelling or fluid in their abdomen, they notice, wow, I haven't changed my eating habits, but my pants are getting tight. What's going on here? Nausea and vomiting, constipation or other change in bowel habits. Now, pericardial mesothelioma is exceedingly rare, but it still does occur. And that is often uh, the symptoms, the early symptoms of that are chest pain, irregular heart rhythm, heart murmur, or shortness of breath. Ovarian cancer. Ovarian cancer, unfortunately, affects about 35,000 women a year in the United States, but there are no, no studies have been done that show that screening for ovarian cancer has made any impact on early detection. But it is important for all women to know that there are symptoms that may be associated with ovarian cancer. And this includes bloating, pelvic or abdominal pain, trouble eating or eat, feeling full quickly, and urinary symptoms such as urgency. I just read a story of somebody who was misdiagnosed as having a urinary tract infection or problems with their, uh, their bladder when in fact they did have ovarian cancer. Other symptoms can include problems with fatigue and upset stomach, change in a women's period if they're still uh, premenopausal, uh, difficulties during intercourse, constipation, back pain, and abdominal discomfort. Laryngeal cancer is cancer in the voice box, um, and that may be manifested with a sore throat that doesn't go away, pain when swallowing, trouble swallowing, ear pain, trouble breathing, weight loss, and people may feel a lump or mass in the neck because the cancer has spread to the nearby lymph nodes. Now, one of the important issues going forward is to think about the fact that many of these diseases take a long period of time to diagnose. So what we have is what's called the long latency period, meaning that you had an exposure. Um, we heard about people who worked on their home 40 years ago, 
people may forget or people may not be aware. So it's important to be aware of potential occupational, environmental, and domestic exposures because we know, as the World Health Organization has very clearly stated, and all of us know this, that no level of exposure to asbestos is safe. It's important to incorporate screening questions into a patient history. What we need to do is make sure that we document their past and present employment history. It's not just important to list what someone does for their living, but what they were exposed to. What types of exposures did they have? Were they biological, chemical, physical, or psychological? This extends beyond it just asbestos exposure, but should be something that we talk about with all our physicians when we have an annual visit or as frequently as you go to the doctor. Also, it's important to think about non-occupational exposures, hobbies, pets, smoking, travel, the home renovations we heard about. It's also important to talk about personal habits and hygiene products because no one asks about cosmetic talc and the use of body powders in, until uh, someone has mesothelioma. And I can tell you from looking at medical records from around the country, no one gets asked about cosmetic talc usage at all, unless they're uh, going to one or two centers in, in the United States. So it's important to think about that if people do develop mesothelioma. So I'd like to thank you for your time. And I think there's gonna be time for Q&A later. And um, back to you, Dr. Markowitz. Thank you, Jackie. That was a, a great uh, overview, very short period of time, but you covered so much, so thank you. Uh, Linda's asked me to announce um, that ADAO has received letters uh, in support of the ban of asbestos from uh, several U.S. senators, including Senator Merkley uh, from Oregon, and also Senators Dane and Danes and Tester from Montana, which of course is where where Libby is. Our next speaker is Dr. Andrea Wolf. She's director of the New York Mesothelioma Program at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, where she's also an associate professor of thoracic surgery. Uh, she has a very unusual background. She has training at the, the premier institutions in thoracic or chest surgery at Brigham and Women's in Boston at Mass General. In addition, she did a research fellowship uh, to, to study oncology, particularly chest cancers, and she has a master's in public health. So she's one of the few public health thoracic surgeons that you may run across. Uh, but her main thing, I think, is uh, operating on people with mesothelioma and lung cancer. She heads the team uh, at, at Sinai, uh, New York Mesothelioma Program, and they've recently won the award from the International Association for the Study of Lung Cancer, uh, the team award for their work. So welcome, Andrea. Thank you, Dr. Markowitz. Thank you, Linda. And thank you to my fellow panelists, the audience, and the Asbestos Disease Awareness Organization. I'm going to share my screen. I have no relevant financial disclosures, but I should disclose that as the center where Selikoff discovered the relationship between asbestos and mesothelioma, we see a lot of mesothelioma patients. And as a surgeon, I've spent decades operating on mesothelioma patients. But the truth is the most important parts of treating these patients, I've learned from a unique capacity. To set the context, it's easiest for me to start here. This is March of 2020. And this is the view from the pediatric ICU at Sinai. That tent across the street on Fifth Avenue is the hospital that they built outside of the hospital. Uh, to accommodate the burgeoning COVID population. At the time, there were 750 COVID patients or 88% of the hospital was COVID. That view though, wasn't from a patient's ICU room. That was actually from my son's room. My son, Georgie, he has a chronic medical condition uh, that he's had for 15 years. And that's what led us to that room. Uh, fortunately, he's improved since the surgery that you see him recovering from here. But for 15 years, we've required very specialized medical care. And he requires care for his disease, but the actual treatment and support, they're for Georgie, who's a person, and for me. And so I admit that 99% of what I have learned about taking care of patients as a surgeon and as a doctor has really occurred through experience 
as a caregiver of someone with a chronic medical condition. And not surprisingly, the concept for my mesothelioma program is modeled after the multidisciplinary program that has cared for us for 15 years. So at Sinai, I've created the New York mesothelioma program. We're currently expanding it to include other asbestos-related diseases through collaboration with Sinai's Cell Cough Center for Occupational Health and the Division of Pulmonology. Our website has been recently revised and the updated version goes live this week. We see patients as a multidisciplinary team. I'm the surgeon. Jorge Gomez is the medical oncologist, and we've recently added Christian Rolfo to this group. Ken Rosenzweig, who essentially invented adjuvant radiation after pleurectomy decortication, he's our radiation oncologist. We have oncogeneralists who specialize in internal medicine for cancer patients, palliative care doctors, social workers, and psychiatrists. Patients are offered opportunity to enroll in clinical trials. In fact, we take the role of offering cutting edge clinical trials very seriously. We're currently accruing patients to a trial evaluating the benefit of this synthetic vaccine called poly ICLC in patients with mesothelioma who are candidates for surgery. Eligible patients undergo biopsy and injection with the vaccine in the same setting, followed three weeks later by surgery. We are a quarter of the way into study accrual and have found that the treatment is very well tolerated and is quite safe. We're currently analyzing the data and following for long-term results to determine the potential benefits in delaying progression and recurrence of mesothelioma and prolonging survival for patients with this disease. Coming back, to the premise for my program. It is in treating the patient, not the disease. In fact, here is the disease. This is meso. It's ugly, like really ugly. That picture at the bottom is as good as it gets after the disease has been removed. And that's what's in the huge bucket in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. But we're not treating the disease. We're treating patients and patients come to us with very personal stories as you've heard in the last day and this morning. These stories while so individual are all too common. Patients come to us with frightening symptoms with or without diagnoses and have often been given grim prognoses by people who don't understand the disease well. They're scared and their caregivers are scared. But our job as surgeons, physicians, scientists, advocates, as human beings, is to take care of mesothelioma patients and their caregivers. And so programs like ours aim to provide comprehensive team-based care to care for these patients and their caregivers, to help our patients and their care caregivers live to fight another day. So thank you for listening and a special thank you to the boy who has taught me everything I know about taking care of patients and families. Uh, thank you, Andrea. Uh, <clears throat> In, in many respects for, for that talk. Actually, I'm, I'm the next speaker, uh, Stephen Markowitz. I'm an occupational medicine physician, epidemiologist. I trained, actually I was the last resident to train under uh, Dr. Selikoff at Mount Sinai in the mid 1980s. I, I was in the faculty at Sinai for uh, 14 years. I left to join the City University of New York uh, 1998 where I've been ever since. And I run the largest occupational medicine screening program uh, in a single industry in the country in the nuclear weapons industry for people who built our nuclear bombs, including for the past 20 years, uh, screening for lung cancer. It's the largest 
occupational lung cancer screening program in the country. So um, let me share my screen here. So what, what I'm gonna talk about is a disease that uh, uh, last year caused over 100,000 deaths. This year will cause well over 100,000 deaths. And the, the shame of it all is that we have in hand a medical intervention that we can use uh, to interrupt, to uh, detect this disease early and keep people from dying from the disease. Uh, I know you think perhaps I'm talking about COVID and the vaccine. We have a vac vaccines in hand that could prevent a lot of deaths, um, which we have, which unfortunately many people either aren't using or don't have access to. But actually I'm talking about lung cancer uh, because this essentially the same condition applies. Uh, over 100,000 people um, will have lung cancer. It's estimated for instance in 2021 that 132,000 people in the US will die from lung cancer. And that applies to both men and women. It's the, the leading cancer in men and women uh, by far. In men, 22% of all cancer deaths. In women, 22% of all lung cancer deaths. So it's far more common as a cause of death in women than say breast cancer, which is number two, or prostate cancer, which is number two in men. And as uh, Linda pointed out yesterday, I think also Dick Lemon this morning mentioned, actually, when you talk about the asbestos cancers, which Jackie reviewed, uh, the number one asbestos cancer is lung cancer. You know, we, we hear a lot about mesothelioma because, uh, because it's a terrible disease and because asbestos is virtually the only known cause. And obviously there are other causes of lung cancer, but actually when you count the number of people who've been exposed to asbestos in the past and develop lung cancer, it very considerably uh, outweighs the number of people with mesothelioma. So we have about 3000 cases of mesothelioma uh, each year in the US. And we have anywhere from uh, six to 30,000 cases of lung cancer due to asbestos, depending on what multiplier you use. So uh, it's an enormous problem. Fortunately, we have a mechanism to detect uh, lung cancer early. And Jackie uh, mentioned this, it is in fact the only asbestos cancer that we can detect early uh, at this point. Uh, and it is through a low dose CT scan. And let me explain what a low dose CT scan is. Low dose means it's a very low dose of radiation, meaning that we can do it every year without harming people. Uh, and it's a regular chest CT scan. It takes about 30 seconds. I mean, it takes you longer to either take off your shirt or change their shirt, what you're wearing, than it does on the uh, CT scanner itself to get the scan. So it's a very easy, low risk scan. It involves no injections and it's really no, no um, obstacles to, uh, in terms of the procedure uh, to receive a low dose CT scan. Now, the, there is some good news here. Um, and the good news uh, this past year is that uh, the US Preventive Services Task Force, which Jackie introduced a few minutes ago, changed its criteria for eligibility. This is important because uh, when the US Preventive Services Task Force says that a certain group is eligible for screening, that means that private insurance, Medicaid, and Medicare have to cover it, okay, for free or for you know, minimal copay. Okay? So we're talking about the group that is now eligible or it's been eligible since 2013, but the task force has changed and broadened the eligibility criteria so that many more people are now or will be soon eligible for CT scanning. Now, the way the US Preventive Services Task Force addresses this, they always focus on age and smoking because that's where the most research has been done. They like to base their uh, studies on their recommendations on as much research as they can. And what they did this year is lower the eligibility age from 55 to 50. So now people at 50, starting at 50 are eligible. They lowered the, the amount of history of cigarette smoking that you needed to have. They went, it used to be 30 pack years. That's a pack a day for 30 years or the equivalent. It could be two packs a day for 15 years. That's 30 pack years and they lowered it to 20. So they lowered the age limit to 50 and they lowered the pack years to 20. Uh, and to be eligible, you have to have quit less than 15 years ago because there are, the idea is that lung cancer risk 
diminishes over time. And so after 15 years, it's less than it is less than 15 years. That's the official group eligible. Let me just give you my opinion, which is that 15 years since quitting is not a good eligibility criteria. People beyond 15 years, you quit 15 years ago, you continue to have risk of lung cancer at 25 years, 20 years, 25 years, even at 30 years. So uh, this criteria you need to interpret, I think with caution, because people who quit longer ago retain the risk of uh, lung cancer and should be screened. But what I'm reviewing is just the criteria by which the insurance company, Medicaid, Medicare, have to uh, provide for free testing every year. Now, as Jackie mentioned, uh, the, the task force made no mention of asbestos or radon or family history of lung cancer or a history of COPD or a history of pulmonary fibrosis. Those are all lung cancer risk factors. And so when you think about your risk, the friends of your at risk of your family, your friends, your coworkers, you should also think not just about age and smoking, but you need to think about other exposures, obviously, especially asbestos exposure going back in time, but also other occupation environmental exposures and the uh, uh, family history or other diseases as well. Let me just say also, you know, that the asbestos related lung cancer risk, unlike smoking, it does not go down in time it goes up in time. So normally when you're exposed to asbestos, you begin age 20, your risk for lung cancer, for the most part, doesn't kick in until you're 45 or 50 or 60, and then goes up in time. Unlike cigarette smoking, when you stop smoking, your risk goes down in time. So I thought that uh, you should know about that. Now, that's the good news, an expanded group at, uh, who can uh, have this uh, life-saving procedure, low-dose CT. But here's the bad news. Only 14% of people who are eligible for lung cancer screening every year actually do it. So for every seven people who meet the traditional criteria of age and smoking, out of every seven people, only one of them actually gets low-dose CT scan in the past 12 months. Uh, it was introduced 2013 and officially sanctioned by the government in 2013. It's been going up very slowly since 2013. Eight years later, we're about 14%. But that means that the vast majority of people who could benefit from this procedure are not getting this procedure. And, you know, it's sort of like the COVID and the vaccine. I mean, we can do it. It's in hand. And whereas we've got 70% of people who are vaccinated in the country, at least adults, We've got 14% of people who should be getting lung cancer screening, getting lung cancer screening at present. And so that means that this year, there will be 12 million people in this country who are eligible for lung cancer screening who will not be screened. And this is uh, enormously frustrating. Now, it's not for lack of CT facilities in the country. I have a little a map of New York City and the 58 different radiology facilities. Uh, Mount Sinai, but Northwell and other places, I must say, 58 facilities where we, Andrea, Jackie, and I who live in New York can get screened. But I also have a nice little picture of the screening center in San Marcos, Texas, the ARA radiology facility. That's where Dr. Bonfortin lives. Now, I'm not suggesting that Celeste have, have this scan. What I'm saying is in San Marcos, Texas, there is a scanning facility that does low-dose CT. And I also have a little picture of Cabinet Peaks Medical Center. I think Cabinet Peaks Medical Center probably only means something to one person on this call. I think it's Brad Black, because that's in Libby, Montana, is where you can get your CT, low dose CT scan. There are over 4,300 facilities recognized by the American College of Radiology in the country that do low dose CT scan. It is available. So that is not a reason why people are not getting scanned. We have now more people eligible. We have uh, expert facilities throughout the country, and we have increasing reimbursement of low-dose CT scan. So what's the problem? I think the problem is that people don't know about this. And the problem is they're not educated. And the problem is they're not motivated. And some people are afraid because they consider lung cancer a death sentence. And actually the early detection of lung cancer, what we find, what, uh, what Andrea sees when she does surgery on these patients are very small, usually 
half inch to maybe one inch small lung cancers that have not spread, that are removable through a scope. And Andrea can tell you more about that. Uh, but it's eminently uh, resectable by surgery. And most of those people don't need uh, radiation or chemotherapy afterwards. So people uh, don't have that knowledge about what early lung cancer is because they know, as we know from our own personal experience, friends, family, coworkers, of how many people get lung cancer and how many people die from lung cancer, that we equate lung cancer with a death sentence. It is not a death sentence if people participate in early detection. And so my plea, my frustration is that how do we increase the knowledge? How do we increase people's understanding of what lung cancer can be if detected early? And how do we motivate people uh, to be screened for lung cancer? So we have some time for questions. And uh, I would, I'm, I'm gonna start off with a few questions. If there are uh, other panelists who have questions uh, of others on the panel, uh, then you can ask them as well. But let me start off with Laura and Bob. I'm interested when you do this uh, education, uh, when you show up at the fairs or the other venues, uh, what kind of reception do you get? Uh, how seriously pe do people take what you say? Do you, and, and is there any evidence that they, they take what they learn from you and actually uh, act differently that they that in their own do-it-yourself uh, renovations at home or otherwise uh, that they actually take actions based on what you're able to inform them about? Well, that's a, a good question. Thank you. Um, I'll just back up a little bit to the um, film yesterday, Dirty Laundry. You saw a little bit of the Amber community. Amber is a very small municipality um, and, uh, and, and it's old. Um, it, it, the Keys being Madison asbestos factory began in the 1800s. Ambler's on the Pennsylvania Railroad line. I mean, if you know the history of Ambler and the asbestos legacy, um, it's been around a long time, but it's fast becoming a very boutique community. Um, they do have these annual events, spring and fall, Christmas parades. It's, it's only about four blocks long, but it's some of the old mom and pop shops are still there, but there's galleries and restaurants and boutiques and they, um, the municipality isn't really fond of us talking about asbestos, but we do it anyway. We had a booth um, at the Oktoberfest two years ago. Last year, there was nothing this year. Uh, but two years ago, and you know, we're surrounded by tents with vendors, with candles, and uh, all sorts of wonderful things that you see. And there we are. And Tony Rich was there with his his display. And um, we we really just sometimes we need people to come to us, but when we get them, we share. And and most of them say, "We didn't know that. We didn't know there was still asbestos. We didn't we didn't know, and neither did we." Yeah. And that's that's really where why we're here because we didn't know so so we we try to make sure we, we enlighten people um they they're typically they're surprised what they do with that we don't know but we give them the information yeah and, and like laura said or you had mentioned it's it's sometimes it's a tough sell but i didn't know i i was in construction for years but i you know my misunderstanding was it was in the attics and that was pretty much it and I didn't realize it was in the tile floor, the mastic in the floor, inside sheetrock and firewalls and this and that. And I've had, when we do these events, there are, there are breakthroughs. I've even had construction people take that flyer and be like, really? I didn't know it was there. So, it, you know, there are positives, there are shining lights, um, but it's a tough sell in Ambler. People want to forget about it, but there are the realists who realize like it's still an issue. So. Yeah, makes me think that, you know, if there is success in setting up a, a registry of exposure or an inventory of exposure across the country in the U.S. from existing materials, that there's going to be have to be a massive education job to get people to understand what it means that those materials might be in your living space. Uh, question for Andrea: uh, You know, we talk about early detection of lung cancer, uh, and we've got this nice x-ray technique to do that. I know there's been a lot of work on early detection of mesothelioma 
And I'm talking about mostly mesothelioma in the chest because most mesothelioma is in the chest. I know how it's extremely difficult to come up with a method of early detection of mesothelioma by nature of the disease. But what, what, are, what are the real prospects? Because I know people have been working on this for a couple, at least a couple of decades. I know you're working on it. Um, and are, are we getting close at all? I don't mean to be a Debbie Downer, Steve, but, but not really. Um, in fact, one of the comments I was going to make to, to Laura um, was that you guys are doing so much more for prevention, awareness, early detection than I can do. Um, unfortunately, the low dose CT is probably the best I have right now also. And even that, as, as you and I know, and as uh, many of us see, often doesn't detect it. Um, we have many patients who've had the disease for years who go without, uh, without a diagnosis, even in the setting of symptoms and, uh, and signs of the disease. Unfortunately, patients come to me with years of recurrent pleural effusions or fluid accumulating between the lung and the rib cage. And they've had multiple procedures, sometimes invasive procedures. I had a patient of Al Tiersten's who, um, who had uh, such a case and had surgery and had operative biopsies without a diagnosis until he had presented with later stage disease. And, uh, and so I, I, I wish I could give a, a more optimistic outlook in terms of early detection, but the best we have is, is to assess people's exposure to know who to follow closely and to have a very heightened suspicion in the setting of anything abnormal. Um, and for patients who have had exposure, uh, the best I, I can recommend right now is a low dose CT. Uh, thank you. I, and uh, fortunately, it's the same low dose chest CT that's used for detect lung cancer as mesothelioma in the chest. So uh, it's not a, it's not a, a second uh, medical test. It's the same test. So when people show up for their early lung cancer detection, they're also getting what may be a technique for early early detection of mesothelioma. But I, on a, on a hopeful note, I know there's a fair amount of work on this and interest in early detection of mesothelioma. So uh, hopefully that work will be supported and, and, and continue. And uh, let me turn. I just yeah, want to make a, a quick plug before we move on, just on the subject of the economy of that early detection test. We get a lot of bang for that buck. And, um, and so we also get a calcium score, which assesses coronary risk factors. We also get breast cancer detection with those scans. So just to make another um, sort of uh, plug for the low dose yeah. CT. And, yeah, and, and not to pile on, but in our, we screen 14,000 people with low dose CT. We also can pick up aortic aneurysms. Which, are, which can be corrected. So that, and the occasional kidney cancer, which can also be uh, resected. So there is a lot of benefit from the low dose CT. Uh, let me move on to Dr. Maline. Um, you know, on the same vein actually uh, of early detection, uh, because ovarian cancer as you, affects 35,000 women, or at least maybe, maybe it was deaths. I don't recall exactly whether there was deaths or number of cases, but in any event, a lot of women. And there has been work on early detection of ovarian cancer. Um, and what do you, do you, are you aware of sort of what the status of that is? Or uh, I know we don't have a screening method for ovarian cancer, but, um, but I know there's been work on it. Did, can you fill us in at all? Yeah, thanks, Stephen. It's, you know, it's, it's one of those insidious cancers. And by that, I mean, it, it takes um, a long time for the symptoms to appear in many cases. And they have looked to see if people at high risk, and, and, and there are certain groups of people who may get screening, those who may have a genetic mutation, um, the BRCA gene, where there's an association with increased risk of ovarian cancer and breast cancer. It's a family um, cancer syndrome that may get either some, in some cases, people get prophylactic um, ovarian removal if they have um, already had children or they will um, to prevent them because they are at very high risk. But for the general population, 
despite looking to see if ultrasounds, which are um, an easy screening test, doesn't require any needles or, or, or actually any radiation per se, um, have been effective in identifying or early de earlier detection, and they haven't. So um, it has, they've looked, they've tried, there have been large scale clinical trials to see if any screening tests do work, um, but they haven't found that except for these very small groups of folks that may avail themselves of screening on a more regular basis. It's really one of those, again, it's, it's, you have to let your body speak to you. And if you begin having unusual symptoms early, and this, it, this goes for mesotheliomas as well, which is, you know, to Andrea's point or to Dr. Wolf's point, when a patient that I'm seeing that I know as asbestos exposure shows up with a pleural effusion, I don't even, I just send them right to Dr. Wolf or one of her counterparts because I know that chances are they're not going to find any fluid or they're not going to find any cancer cells in the fluid, yet they may be an early stage cancer. For ovarian cancer, we need to make sure people are aware of the early symptoms so that they can get checked out so that it can be early detected. And it's really one of those prevention by understanding what the early symptoms are, which are again, non-specific. Yeah. And, and it actually, it raises the point that, you know, the, the level of care, the understanding of the diseases, the medical surgical skill is really so much better at the places that are dedicated to this. I mean, Dr. Wolf's New York mesothelioma program. There's a comparable one in Boston and Houston and some other places. But for people who don't live in those areas, uh, who, but who are be beginning to have problems that could well be mesothelioma, uh, uh, it, it is definitely worth uh, looking to those facilities uh, to get uh, proper treatment and the like. Um, I, Brad, you, you, maybe you can, uh, straighten something out for me. I've heard Linda say that Richterite, which is part of Livyamphibol, is also known as sodium tremolite. Of course, tremolite is a recognized asbestos fiber. And so I, I don't know if this is, I know you're not a geologist, so just, you know, forgive me <laughs> if this isn't your area, but uh, is Richterite a, a, a name that is sort of an industrial name? And it, it, should it be considered sodium tremolite for the purposes of classification? And this has, this is not an esoteric issue. This has to do with, you know, how it might be treated under a ban, et cetera. So Brad, any, any, can you fill me in here? <laughs> well, you're, you know, when you get into that world of, uh, of uh, description of minerals, uh, you'll find nomenclature changes on you. And of course, for years, uh, the, uh, fibers that contaminated this vermiculite deposit were called uh, sodium rich trimolite or, um, and so they had various names for it because they really couldn't categorize it as well. But uh, uh, the, uh, certainly the, when the nomenclature changed, I somewhere in the, I have to remember the late eighties or something. Anyway, a lot of the deposits were never restudied or re-examined and, and characterized for their fiber types, even though nomenclature had changed. So when uh, the, the, the situation broke in Libby, uh, the, uh, the USGS restudied the, the mineral content at the mine site and uh, realized that uh, most of this was not trimolite, but most of it was richterite uh, and winchite, winchite being the most predominant, 84% of the fibers were winchite, which is non-regulated in, in richterite. Once again, another 15, 15% non-regulated. Uh, no, I don't think we can squeeze it in on that. Uh, we're still stuck without a regulatory recognition, unfortunately. Uh, and, and I think, you know, mainly, you know, I don't know, there are a lot of excuses I know. And probably one of those is there's pushback because uh, Libby's not the only place that has these types of fibers. It just happens to be a place where we exploited another mineral for uh, commercial use that had to be contaminated with them, but across the country, there, uh, there we found other uh, deposits of minerals near the surface uh, that are uh, similar types of fibers, such as in Nevada uh, and uh, other places around the U.S. So it's it's just uh, 
unfortunate in, in when you had a product like vermiculite, which uh, was a good product, and we don't know of hazards from it, had to have this contamination, unfortunately. But uh, I don't think we're going to squeeze them in or we're stuck okay. with trying to get the recognition uh, as separate regulated fibers. And I think going forward, it would make a lot of sense to have them regulated. We're going to run into it again when we're doing activities, uh, whether it's in road building or other things that we do. We're going to run into these in different parts of the country. And to have a regulation on them now would be extremely important in my mind. Okay. Thank you, Brad. That, that, that really did clarify it. Thank you. I want to thank the panelists. I thought it was a very an excellent panel, very, very informative.